Ilya Tuporia is arguably the best boxer in the UFC. I mean, we already broke down how well he uses his hips, but what exactly about his ability to move his hips makes him unique? In the beginning of this video, we're gonna take a look at what makes Tuporia's hip movement so special. Now the second and third part of the video, we'll be putting it all together. Discussing how all of the biomechanical components came together to give us one of the best knockouts of 2024. All right guys, the UFC has finally released the views that we've been wanting to see and the views that you guys have been asking for. So this is the part two. All right, and so what I'm looking at whenever I see really good fighters move, one of the components of that, since movement is my job, is looking at the timing. Okay, so timing is, is everything. Boxers have really good hip movement. They have to in order to create good power. Fighters in general typically have to be able to maneuver their body in a way that is beneficial for them in the moment. But something that I think Tuporia does really, really well and uniquely well is timing his hip switch. It's particularly with this left hook. And so I'm really happy that we got this view. So when he disengages, think about what we've talked about in previous videos. Okay, so we, we want to, with the, with the left hook, we typically see the lead hook, that, that shoulder and hip separation creates a lot of tension in the trunk and the anterior portion of the muscles in the shoulder, which we'll talk about later. So he plants that front foot and he starts to pivot around it like a really good hook. But look where, look where Max is and look where Tapori is. He's halfway through the strike and Max doesn't even hardly, hasn't even locked eye contact. He doesn't know where he's at, right? So as it, or, or he's preparing for something that's about to happen, which did happen. So as he disengages, his hips are already kind of perpendicular to the plane of his hips, okay? And then his shoulders are obviously lagging behind, which we'll talk about in a second, but that rotational that torque or that force about the axis in the transverse plane around that vertical axis is happening immediately as soon as his front leg lands on the ground after he disengages. So keep this in mind next time when you're watching really good fighters. I'm not gonna play this all the way through because the UFC will almost undoubtedly copyright me, so sorry about that in advance. But as soon as, as soon as people start to disengage and create space, watch how well they time their hip switch. And that will tell you how good of a striker they are or how well, uh, the oppor how opportunistic of a fighter they are. And Tapuri is one of the more opportunistic fighters, particularly boxers in the UFC. All right, this insanely good view is gonna give us a really good idea of how Topuria uses the, the kinetic chain, okay? And typically, we start with the, the rear leg, right? So we're looking at strikes and they plant and they kind of shift their weight to the front leg and it comes all the way up and through the upper extremity. But with this kinetic chain, when he plants, he's actually got most of his weight already on that front leg, okay? So he's pivoting around this leg and the, and the, the kinetic chain is actually going up and through his arm kind of on the same side. We usually see it kind of cross over the spine. but Let's take a look. So this leg is actually able to externally rotate at the hip so easily because, again, he's only kind of using that as a kickstand here. This is a, this is a stabilizer. So he's kind of plantar flexing. He's doing that kind of triple extension that we see. Well, actually, he's really only extending the ankle with muscles like the gastroc and the soleus plantar flexion and then knee extension with muscles like the quads. But he's externally rotating his hips as a byproduct of that left lumbopelvic rotation with just external rotators at the hip, like the glute and a couple of deep external rotators that I'll show a picture of up on the screen. But let's talk about that lead leg. So as he's pivoting around, there are a couple of things happening. So he's dorsiflexing the foot because it enables him to create this kind of valgus angle at the knee and then a byproduct of that is hip internal rotation. So this allows him to, to shift his hips even more. So he's got external rotation in the closed chain on the right side, and then hip internal rotation on the other side in the closed chain. Now he doesn't all the way internally hip or uh, internally rotate the hip because he's pivoting his ankle. Now if his ankle were to stay planted and that hip were to continue to internally rotate, it would create a lot of valgus force here at the knee with that compression could be potentially injurious, but he didn't do that. So he uses his lower body really well. And now let's shift our attention up here to the trunk. Okay, we're gonna look at the hips and we're gonna look at the shoulders. So now that we've got really good movement here at the lower extremity, what that does is create tension here in the trunk, particularly in a really big muscle called the external oblique that's on the side 
of the strike. The external oblique performs contralateral rotation. So this is on the left side, so it would be rotating his hips to the right, which is what he's doing. So he's rotating his hips to the right. The, there's a big stretch being put on the oblique, since the oblique runs from that iliac crest all the way up to the rib cage, because those shoulders are lagging behind, right? So there's that big stretch being put. If you look at the fibers and the way that they run, the external oblique is being put on a big stretch. The other muscles that are being put on a big stretch here are the pec major and the anterior delt. So the pec major and the anterior delt, again, are responsible for that, that horizontal adduction at the glenohumeral joint at the shoulder. So that tension created here at the external oblique and the pec and the anterior delt is an eccentric elongation of the muscle followed by a switch between the eccentric and concentric contraction called the amortization phase. And then that after that amortization phase, it creates the environment for a much stronger concentric contraction. And then it lands perfectly on the button, which again, we'll talk about here in a minute. So he's got really good mechanics down here at the left leg. He's rotating his hips to the right. Okay, so right lumbopelvic rotation. He's got external rotation and internal rotation respectively on the right and the left hip. Creates a ton of tension in the muscles like the external oblique in the trunk and then up in the anterior shoulder girdle, the pec major and the anterior delt. He concentrically contracts them powerfully and then follows all the way through, resulting in a knockout. Beautiful stuff. All right, guys, and this third view is showing my favorite thing about so far with this channel has been learning about the biomechanics of the knockout or the acute loss of consciousness. And it really shows how this tends to happen. So we used to think that it was a coup contra coup injury. That means that whenever you make contact with the head or the head makes contact with a certain part of the ground or like a wall or something like that or a whiplash in a car accident that the brain would kind of hit one side of the head or one side of the skull and then kind of ricochet off and hit the other side of the skull kind of this rebound effect but what we're understanding now and it makes more sense now why the button is so commonly used but a little bit misunderstood is there's not actually a nerve here on the chin. Well, there, there are nerves here on the chin, but it doesn't make sense for you to hit one nerve and for the whole brain to just kind of lose consciousness or to, to become hyper excitable. What happens is these quick rotational, linear or angular rotational movements or side bending movements cause a really big stretch in the nerve cells, particularly in part of the nerve cell called the axon. And the axon is responsible for carrying signals back and forth. So we think that whenever they stretch, and I say we, I'm talking about the people who actually study this, we think that there are little openings called pores through which we have different ions that change the, the level of polarization of the nerve cell. So they begin to do something called depolarize. And so they depolarize and it creates an action potential with a signal. And this happens over and over and over and over again in several different cells. And so that is what we think causes the acute loss of consciousness, that hyper excitability. So the next time you see a knockout, try to think about how much acceleration and then deceleration is happening. So he's going from relatively neutral position of the spine into a maximal left rotation, and then it's whipping back into neutral, okay? And he's already lost consciousness here. Max is on his way down, okay? So think about that next time, and it doesn't have to be necessarily rotational, but when we get these blows to the button, it's actually the leverage that creates a lot of rotational acceleration then deceleration, and therefore traction on those axons that we think causes that acute loss of consciousness. So just really good views. I hope this doesn't get copyrighted, but you know, I had to make the video anyway. You guys requested it over and over and over again. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.